welcome back. Uh, I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and this is an EKG case for a 77-year-old male complaining of weakness and chest discomfort. His uh, only history that we know of is uh, hypertension, and as I said, he's just got a little bit of weakness and chest discomfort that began uh, a few hours ago. The patient's warm and dry. His respirations are 22 per minute. Appeared to be uh, uh, unlabored. SpO2 is 97% on room air and blood pressure is 144 over 88. Heart rate is 75. Uh, his Glasgow is 15. He's totally compass mentis, alert and oriented times three. And he's saying that the pain is about eight out of 10 and it's just a pressure in his chest. And sometimes you have those patients where you ask them, you know, uh, to rate their pain on a 1 to 10 scale and they'll say well it's not really a pain it's a pressure and that's kind of the response that he gives you all right so just looking at this information we have so far nothing really uh, glaring out at you uh, so you're gonna go ahead and get a 12 lead EKG and here's the 12 lead uh, that, that was obtained on this patient all right first thing you should note is that this rhythm changes within the time span of this 12 lead this one happens to have a long lead two on the bottom so you can see what this appears to be either a first degree AV block or, or, or it may even be a second degree type 2 if there were a P wave hidden in here I've measured it out I wasn't able to determine uh, the presence of a P wave in here even this with this little notch that appears to you know be hiding something uh, so we're going with a first degree AV block that goes back into what looks like a sinus rhythm okay um, there doesn't appear to be AV dissociation here, so I wouldn't have called this a third degree AV block. And the fact that it subsides uh, into this sinus rhythm uh, is, you know, obviously good uh, and kind of leans away from that third degree. So looking at this a little bit further, um, you do have a little bit of a pathological left axis deviation. Uh, at least you, you definitely did when you had this other uh, rhythm present uh, and which would lead you to believe that there was some sort of left anterior fascicular block but this is wide right it's wide with the first rhythm and if you look at where even where it changes now this beat is this beat is this beat is this beat so uh, even if you don't think it looks very wide here in lead two you can see that it is in fact wider than your 120 milliseconds or your uh, 0.12 seconds if you will so if you have a, a wide arrhythmia that is supraventricular then you're going to go and we know it is because it's a sinus rhythm um, it, it looks to be if you were questioning what type of sinus rhythm it looks to be a sinus arrhythmia um, and you can see that the the r to r intervals change and typically sinus arrhythmias are due to some sort of chronic respiratory ailment all right again nothing to write home about but we have a wide supraventricular rhythm so what do we do next well typically you look at v1 to determine what type of bundle branch block pattern you have there. And then V1, we do have a left bundle branch block pattern. It's predominantly a negative uh, QRS complex, especially the terminal wave. It's In fact, it's an entirely one uh, QS wave, which is very uh, pathognomonic of a left bundle. And then if you look at V6, you do have a monophasic R wave. You can't really count lead one because remember the rhythm changed. The rhythm changed. All right, so Looking at V1 and V6, we currently have a sinus rhythm, a sinus arrhythmia to be more specific, with a left bundle branch block. So that's where we stop, right? We don't look at left bundle branch blocks any further. Well, uh, a, a few years ago, that was, that was more commonly thought to, to be the norm. Uh, but now we know we can, we can go a little deeper with these left bundle branch blocks. We can, you know, determine whether there's a, a good likelihood of STEMI present. And how do we do that? Well, first, let's look at the next uh, uh, slide here where I, I have all of the diagnostics. Now, the 12 EDKG does not call this a STEMI, all right? It does identify the left bundle branch block. Um, and it, it does, uh, and it, in, in fact, I remember I said there was a left anterior fascicular block. Well, if you have a left bundle branch block, you know you have a left anterior fascicular block. In fact, you have a left posterior fascicular block as well. That's what a left bundle branch block is. It's a block of both of those left fascicles. And you can see that it identified the QR restoration uh, in the 146 millisecond range, okay? All right, so we have our diagnostics here. 
and we're going to discuss SCAR BOSA's criteria. You have, you have a left bundle that you want to identify for a possible uh, STEMI or, or signs of a STEMI, which would be an ST elevated myocardial infarction. So looking at this 12 lead, the, the two things you're going to look for are going to be concordant ST segment changes and discordant ST segment changes. Now, any concordant ST segment changes are highly indicative of an MI, no matter what 12 lead you're looking at. If you have excessive discordance, then it's indicative of an MI. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, let's look at the next slide to kind of explain it a little bit better. So over here on the left, we have what we would call T wave discordance, um, where the T wave is in the opposite direction of the last wave of the QRS complex, which is usually the dominant wave, okay? And so you have a negative QRS complex here with a positive T wave, and that drags the ST segment up. That's a normal variant it, for it to drag the ST segment up. So if we're trying to identify a myocardial infarction, well, we know that it's normal for it to drag it up maybe one, two millimeters, and in a left bundle branch block, maybe a few more millimeters. But if it drags it up more than five millimeters, that would be highly indicative of uh, ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. The same goes for ST segment depression that is discordant. If you had excessive ST segment depression or excess, excessive discordant ST segment depression where your uh, QRS dominant wave or terminal wave is positive and the T wave is negative, dragging the ST segment down, well, if you have more than five millimeters of that ST segment depression, well, you, you, you have a high likelihood of having a, a ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. Now, that's the original Scarbosa criteria rule for discordance. All right. And th there is a modified rule from Dr. Stephen Smith of Dr. Stephen Smith's ECG blog. He's a genius when it comes to electrocardiography. Um, and he kind of uses a percentage rule. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I don't want to confuse you too much before we go on to concordance. Now, ST segment uh, concordance is when that the ST segment goes in the same direction as the dominant wave of the QRS complex. So if you look over here on the right, you have a terminal wave that is positive and the ST segment's positive, the QRS complex is positive, the ST segment's positive, that's concordant ST elevation. And as I said before, that's always a, a, a bad, you know, or likelihood is higher uh, with concordant ST elevation that that's a bad sign, that that's a sign of probably uh, myocardial infarction. So in the presence of a left bundle branch block, if you have concordant ST elevation or concordant ST segment depression, um, then it meets Scarbosa's criteria just by one millimeter or more, okay? Uh, just same as your regular STEMI criteria of one millimeter. So this kind of uh, juxtaposition here of the concordant ST segment elevation discordant SC segment elevation to give you the a visual of the of the difference all right so again if you have concordant SC segment elevation of greater than one millimeter or discordant SC segment elevation greater than five millimeters uh, you meaning scarbosa's criteria for a uh, in, in this these discordant uh, SC segment elevation uh, leads would typically be uh, your precordial leads, V1 through V6. That's where you would usually see that. All right, now this patient was experiencing an MI. I'm going to go ahead and, and fast forward to the angiogram here. So here's the pre. This is where they were uh, before getting uh, reperfusion therapy. You can see that the LED kind of stops perfusing right about there. There's no blood flow to this extended part. And then after they reperfused, they had great blood flow and a lot of tissue was saved. So let's go back to the 12 lead. Now that we've seen uh, Scarbosa's criteria, and I told you that this is in fact a myocardial infarction, are there 12 lead findings that indicate that this was a myocardial infarction? And yes, is the answer, there are. So we could start, you know, just kind of uh, chronologically, even if you look at lead one before the rhythm changed, you see concordant ST segment elevation. Now, it's not as uh, profound as you might expect, but if you look here, all right, this is the baseline in lead one and drag that across, and you could certainly see that the J point is elevated, all right, uh, in the same direction as the T wave. Now, the, it's, it's 
difficult with this one because it's equiphasic. So maybe that, uh, I don't want to confuse you. The, the more obvious one would be AVL, if you're looking at one in AVL. Uh, AVL obviously has a terminal wave that's positive, uh, and the SC segment is elevated, so it's in the same direction as the dominant terminal wave of the QRS complex, so it is in fact elevated there. So start with that one. That, that, that's a better example of concordant SC segment elevation. And then if you look at V2, all right, all right, I'm just kind of going to random leads here. V2, uh, you see excessive discordant seg uh, SC segment elevation where the dominant terminal wave is negative, the SC segment is elevated, so it's opposite direction, which we know can normally happen. Uh, but here we have more than five millimeters of SC segment elevation. Now V3 doesn't, maybe right on the edge of five millimeters, but doesn't have quite five millimeters SC segment elevation. Uh, you know, probably three and a half, maybe four millimeters of SC segment elevation. So that one doesn't meet it. Um, but look at, skip V4, because that also doesn't have it. But V5, you have some more concordant SC segment elevation where that, even though it's a small QRS complex, and remember that things should be proportionate. So the size of the SC segment elevation is proportionate to the QRS complex. All right, so the, the positive terminal dominant wave QRS complex with the up ST segment, meaning it, it's elevated, right? So both are in the positive directions, concordant elevation, and you have about a millimeter there. So that's also a bad sign. And then over here, I skipped AVF, but you do have uh, what looks like a concordant ST segment depression, and you could see it in lead three as well before the rhythm changed. So despite, and you would have seen it if this rhythm continued over, uh, you probably would have seen it. You see SC segment depression in the inferior lead. So what does this pattern fit? Well, you have lateral elevation and you can see that it all, you know, goes all the way to the anterior wall. Uh, so we're looking at an LAD occlusion, obviously. We, we know that's the answer. Uh, that's what the angio showed us. All right, so I, I know I wasn't very systematic in interpreting this 12 lead. I just wanted to show you the many different changes. Now, that modified Scarbosa criteria that I talked about from Dr. Stephen Smith, what he says, and he's changed it a couple times to be more specific, but I like, uh, you know, keeping it as wide as range of, as possible, and this kind of makes it easy. If you look at the amount of SC segment elevation, this is, we're just talking about discordance because concordance is the same rule. If you see concordant SC elevation or car concordant depression, it meets Scott Scarbosa's criteria and it's a high likelihood of being a, an MI. But if, if you don't have that and you're looking uh, for discordant SC segment elevation, now instead of counting to make sure it's five millimeters, what he does is he, like I said, it's proportionate. So for it to be excessive SD elevation, you can have that and not have an MI if you have a very deep QRS complex uh, and you had over five millimeters of SD elevation, well, that dis discordance may be proportionate, so it might not actually be indicative of an MI. What he says is if it's 25%, so, oops, I'm moving that 12 there. If the uh, actual ST segment elevation is 25%, the size of the preceding S wave, then it's more indicative, and he, he has a very high sensitivity uh, for this, of a, a myocardial infarction. So 25%, so that would be a quarter. So if you look here, well, this is almost half of the, the size of this, you know, look how much SC segment elevation you have there. We, we said it's about five or six millimeters there. And it, this S wave is maybe 10, maybe 11 millimeters. So we're at about half or 50%. So we definitely reached that 25% rule. That's indicative of an MI. Now, if you go here to V3, and you, let's say you had four millimeters of SC segment elevation here, and this S wave was, uh, let's see, five, 10, maybe 12 millimeters. Well, four millimeters is a third. So it's more than 25% of that preceding S wave. But V4 is even more convincing. Now that, this one doesn't have five millimeters of SC segment elevation. Let's say it's got about three, but the preceding S wave okay, is only about five. So that's more than 50% the size of that preceding S wave. That's highly indicative of uh, a myocardial infarction. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. Uh, the main rule here is to understand the rules of discordance, excessive discordance, and uh, uh, concordance. So if you have concordant ST segment changes, 
almost always bad. And if you have discordant SC segment changes, you're looking for that excessive discordance. And if it's excessively uh, elevated or depressed, then it's uh, got a higher likelihood of a myocardial infarction. And again, here was the angio pre and post reperfusion. Uh, and this patient had a great outcome due to the uh, providers being able to identify the presence of a STEMI uh, despite uh, you know, a pre-existing left bundle branch block.